Afternoon, everyone. We're back for the third core shares webinar, which is time in the market, not time in the market. Um, welcome, Chris. It's been a while. Uh, good to have you back. And um, obviously, we, we want to run through a few things, and we've got a giveaway um, to conclude this series, which is a great book called The Little Book of Common Sense Investing. So um, it's going to go to the person with the best questions related to the topic or um, any of the topics that were discussed in the previous webinars. Um, so I don't know, Chris, if you want to just quickly kick it off with yeah, sure. the, um, I guess, the first part of the timing market. 100%. Th thanks, uh, Brian, and thanks to the Easy Equity guys for hosting us today. And most of all, thanks to you guys for attending. Sorry about the little uh, complication or confusion with the starting time. Um, today we're chatting about our third core principle, which is... Um, time in the market, not timing the market. If I can just do a quick recap, the first one was keeping it simple as smart. And basically that was saying that it's very difficult to outperform an index return um, and, and, that, and, it, and, it, and it becomes a very difficult task. The second was keep more returns for yourself. And that whole message was really about um, being cost sensitive, making sure that your costs are low, et cetera, et cetera. And then today we're chatting about time in the market, not timing the market. Now, this is something that you may have heard of. And really, the, the message here is as an investor, you should have a long-term plan and then stick to it. Really stick to it. Don't, um, don't, don't, don't try and, and vary away from it too much. So, like, the, the real message is, uh, you know, and, and a lot of, of first-time investors, a lot of new investors say this is very simple. We just buy low and then we sell high. And, you know, it's as easy as that. And if you have a look at the graph that's up on your screen, um, you'll see that there's opportunities to actually to do that, to buy high or to buy low and to sell high. But in reality, um, this is a very difficult uh, task to actually achieve. In fact, there are multiple studies and some of the greatest investment minds like Benjamin Graham and John Bogle, etc., advise against timing the market because it really is a losing game. In other words, most people who try and time the market actually get it wrong. We'll show some cool slides just now about how, how difficult it is to time the market. But there's some research by uh, in the US where they tracked um, some uh, self-described market timing experts, um, 28 of them, and only 10 of them were able to accurately forecast equity returns over 50% of the time. And interestingly, none of them, so not one of them, was able to predict returns accurately enough to outperform the market. In other words, they were getting some calls right, but they were equally getting calls wrong. And in fact, the calls they were getting wrong were more detrimental to their portfolio success than the ones they were getting right. So it really is difficult, if not impossible, to time the markets, to do that thing, which seems so easy of just buying low and selling high. So this is a little illustration that shows exactly what the impact of being out of the market is, because that's really what hurts you as an investor when you're trying to time the markets. It's often the, the, those bill, those short um, uh, correction periods that you miss and, and that, that it's hugely uh, detrimental to your investing success. So this is an illustration which looks at missing the top 12 month performers um, over a 10, a, 30, a 20 and a 30 year period. So you just miss 12 months of, or the 12 best um, performing months in a 30 year period and your annualized return is some four, four and a half percent lower. So it's very significant in terms of how important it is to be in the market, to be fully invested when the markets run. And it's really difficult to time those markets as I showed uh, previously in, in, in this slide. So it's a very simple message. Um, and, and in line with all our other core principles, it's really, this was a five minute gig, just to give you some information about how difficult it is to time the market and we would really encourage investors to make investments, stick to their plans, not to become too um, uh, concerned about trying to get in at the right time. And, you know, investing is a long term uh, principle. So, you know, when you whenever you see graphs over long periods of time, generally, you know, in the equity markets, you, you're going to improve your returns. You're going to move up. So time is your friend and impulse is your enemy. Is the final quote we're going to leave this little uh, section off on. Um, and uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, we're right here. As I mentioned, it was really short. If you've got questions about trying to time the markets or uh, any questions relating to investments or ETFs, we've got uh, 
uh, Brian here from Easy Equities, and, and I'm sitting here, and we, we're happy to take as many questions uh, as possible. Thanks so much, Chris. I think um, now before we get into questions from the the guys on board, let's um, just tie off a few questions that um, are common questions that we see with uh, some Easy Equities users. And the first is, you know, I'm, I'm fairly new to investing. I'm quite keen on getting some exposure to the market, but my time horizon is is fairly short. So. Um, what I'd like to just quickly discuss is, you know, there, do I time the market? Do I just put my funds in? What are the things I'm thinking of? Yeah, so look, time horizon is a very important consideration when you're looking to make an investment. Generally, you know, any time horizon that's short term in nature, you, you, you can't really afford to invest into the equity markets because of the volatility in those markets. So we work on a principle of you know, 12 months or less, you should pretty much be in a cash allocation if you're looking for, a, if you have what we call a liquidity event, or basically your horizon is less than 12 months, you should be allocated 100% in cash. And, and it's really simple, the principle is simple that if you do invest in equities, let's look at our uh, top 40, for example, let's say you invested in equities exactly a year ago, ago from today, you would have done fantastically well, I think you would be up about 10, 15%, depending on which uh, uh, you know uh, ETFs you bought on our local market and yes you'd be it would be great you'd have an extra 15% cash but if you had done that let's say uh, with a time horizon ending six months ago you probably would have lost cash so equity investments are long-term investments we would recommend the five plus time horizon five year plus time horizon for any equity investments and what you can do is you can stop lending asset classes to try and match that time horizon with your with your need or or, or or your investment to match your time horizon at least i'm not sure if you yeah i agree i tend to i tend to think that we sometimes view everything as an all or nothing and you don't have to be 100 percent exposed to equities or 100 percent exposed to cash um it's more about as you say just finding that balance and um, aligning that to the short-term or long-term goals that you're looking to achieve um, also, the, I agree 100% that you know, even with the current political ups and downs, you've seen the JC do, um, I think it's 13% for the top 40, and um, that's phenomenal. And you know, that's also something that you shouldn't be scared of, or um, as you said, impulse to, to quickly jump ship, uh, stick to the plan. Um, it's obviously a plan for a reason, and um, yeah, I think that, that would serve you well. Sure. Yeah, we've got one question um, that was emailed through from Pete. He's asking about uh, the, val the valuations of our currency relative to other major currencies. Um, assume, I'm assuming Pete means uh, other developed market currencies, so GBPs, US dollars, uh, yen, euros, etc. Um, and he's asking what we think would be a fair value of our currency um, relative to the US dollar. And are we heading towards a fair value? Um, so, Peter, I'm going, to, I'm going to answer this in a perhaps a convoluted way, but um, the the rand and currencies are notoriously difficult to predict exactly where fair value is um, as a starting point. So, you know, to say that to pin an exact figure to say that the fair value of the rand to the dollar is 11, and therefore, you know, the the rand is cheap. Um, and you should hold on to your rounds and wait until it's uh, uh, stronger to invest in more dollars. You know, that's a very difficult call to make. And in fact, not dissimilar to timing the markets. If you look, mo most market participants really struggle uh, to make, you know, fair calls on what a fair value of a currency is. What we would kind of, what we would encourage is to say that as a South African investor, you tend to have a lot of South African rand exposure. So, You've probably got a, you potentially have a house, you've got your provident fund, which will be invested 75% in local assets. Um, you've got a lot of um, structural reasons why you will be overweight the South African rand. So, um, you know, it, it, some, some of those reasons that I mentioned. It's, some, it's something that's called the home bias, and it's a very common phenomenon in investing globally. So, what, what, what we would encourage is rather than trying to time, not dissimilar to our message of time in the markets and timing the markets, rather than trying to time currencies and 
you know, invest in the, you know, the, 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 the rand and, 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 or the dollar when rands are weak and so on and so forth, is to make a consistent allocation to hard currency or developed market currencies like you're talking about. Um, so, you know, to hold a basket of um, hard currency exposures is really a reasonable decision to make. And if you're doing so and you're making allocations consistently, you strip a lot of that timing risk out of that allocation. I mean, we just anecdotally, we see a lot of clients who were taking rands and buying dollars just after they negate at like 16 bucks because everyone thought the rand was going to 20. I mean, it, even, even the smartest market participants were calling the rand out at 20 or 18 or whatever their number was. And that's been detrimental to their investing success. But perhaps what they should have been doing at that point in time is just sticking to their plan and every month making allocations offshore or, 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 or hedging themselves against the currency risk. So um, the RAND, you know, in terms of how it's impacted, it's, it's certainly impacted at, at a country specific level. So political risk, uh, economic risk, um, risk of downgrade, those kind of risks. So we, we have a lot of country specific risk at the moment. What we do have equally is we've got a lot of macro tailwinds where over the last year, you've seen a lot of emerging market currencies perform extremely well against their hard currency counterparts. So that's why you've actually seen most of the RAND strength has been a function of a general emerging market um, trade or risk on trade, which we've seen where the, the, the big money movers, uh, the US pension funds and so on and so forth, have been making allocations to emerging markets. So is the RAND fairly valued? As, you know, it becomes a very difficult question to answer, but I think you should be making allocations to hard currencies in any course of event, as opposed to trying to time a specific uh, valuation. I don't know if you want to add to that, Brian, or... No, I think I, I tend to agree. I, I, I've surely practiced that uh, more recently, with just slowly adding a bit every month. I mean, that's almost the, the law of dollar averaging, where... You know, if you're consistently purchasing an equity instrument or, you know, hard currency over a period of time from month to month basis, you're either averaging the cost down or up, but you are averaging the cost compared to if you did a lump sum purchase. And um, there's a lot of investors who, who do think this method is a, a good way to to grow your portfolio. Um, and once again, it's, I guess it is open to personal opinion. Uh, we aren't seeing too many questions come through, guys. Please feel free just to um, click on that questions tab if you do have any questions. Uh, Nick, we're gonna we're gonna be answering yours. So Nick's just asked if we should at least evaluate the economy through long-term yield curves to shift your investments between cash, sorry, bonds and equities. And what is the easiest way to do this? Sorry, I'm just trying to get a better grip of the question. Um, so I think I think Nick, um, what you're asking, um, you you you're trying to understand where the opportunities are on a relative basis between the asset classes. So looking at relative valuation of bonds and then looking at rel relative valuations of shares and are bonds relatively cheaper or more expensive than shares on a I'm not sure in historic on a you're talking about the long-term yield. You know, you also have to take into consider into consideration the medium, short-term yield when you're looking at bonds. Um, um, and 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 how would you, you know, construct a portfolio that you're dynamically allocating between equity and bonds? Again, and 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 I hate to um, drone on about our third message about trying to time the market. This is very much a market timing kind of question, where I would rather encourage you to step away from looking at short-term valuations and relative valuations between equities and bonds and look at what your long-term goal is, what your long-term horizon is, and try and get an asset allocation that is appropriate for that. So let's say you have a very long-term investment. Let's say it's 15 years. You can be you know, very close to 100% in equities over 15 years. But let's say you want to go 80 equities, 20 bonds. The idea should be to try and keep that exposure static through most time periods and maybe evaluated annually or semi-annually. And what you'll find is just by sticking to that asset allocation, you will be rebalancing between the, the asset classes or, or based on their relative valuation. So let's take, take a really simple example. Let's say you go 80% into equities and 20% into bonds. Um, equities run up by 10% for the year. 
um, and bonds are exactly flat. So you've now got a portfolio that's worth 108, but you've got a 88% or closer, a higher percentage in equities. So what you would then do is potentially take some of that equity risk off the table, allocate that to your bonds and go back to your 80-20. So in that instance, you are making a relative valuation call in many instances. That's what kind of a reweighting event does in most instances. So that will do it naturally. And by sticking to your long-term static or strategic asset allocation, you will increase the probability of achieving your goal um, as opposed to trying to tactically asset all allocate, you know, moving from a very high bond position to a very low equity position based on your view of, of valuations and yield curves. Yield curves can also change very quickly as we've seen with, you know, some of the shenanigans that we've had locally um, and, and, and not to mention some of the the, the global uh, the, the global yield environment where, you know, the, the Fed um, is moving from hawkish to dovish in terms of the outlook of the of, of the um, rate hiking environment uh, from from month to month. So, you know, again, try try to step away from a lot of the noise that's in the market in terms of trying to time a, a decision perfectly. Rather rather spend your time working out what is a you know a good strategic asset allocation and stick with that unless your goal of course changes or, or your requirements change. Perfect, Chris. Um, look, we're getting a few questions all on the asset allocations and um, what you're looking at. Chaz, to someone asking, using that same example of a 15-year period, um, you know, what sort of offshore allocation would you would you be looking at? Yeah. So if you if you have um, a 15-year period, you know, that's a very long period of time, and you could be invested 100% on growth assets over that kind of time period. So equity, property. Um, what you would have to consider when you are evaluating how much offshore exposure you want to put into your, let's say, your easy equities uh, portfolio is you'd first of all have to establish what your total scenario or your total holistic uh, portfolio looks like. So you would take into account all of your real assets. So your provident fund, you would take into account your, if you have a home, if you own, an, if you own your own business, if you're an entrepreneur, um, and where your exposure lies. Um, so you might find that you have close to 100% invested in South African equities or, or, or 80%. Then you may want to go a, a significant portion offshore. You may want to go, you know, close close to 80% offshore. Um, if you find that, in fact, you have got a lot of offshore exposure um, and, and, and you, you know, you, you then perhaps don't need such a large offshore exposure. Um, so it really, you know, again, I don't mean to be dodging these questions, but it depends on your personal circumstance. Um, we, we would like to just highlight one point. South Africa on the world scale only makes up 0.7% of all investing opportunities. So if you look at global listed securities that are liquid, South Africa, the top 50, top 40, is less than a percent of that opportunity set. So taking that into account, you should have 99% offshore, right? But of course, we live here and so on and so forth, and, and we are more likely to invest in South African shares. So, you know, that gives you a feel of how, how small South Africa is on a relative basis. Um, so you can go, you know, 80% offshore. There's, there's, there's nothing stopping you doing that, especially if you consider that you've got a lot of RAND exposure, you've got a lot of South African exposure just by being a South African um, in terms of your provident fund you will have 75% in SA, uh, non-negotiable, that's regulatory driven. Um, if your question here is in, in, a, in, a, in a reg 28 environment, then you of course are, are restricted at 25% offshore. So that's a, a non-starter. Um, Perfect. Um, Perfect. Um, look, I'm going to play devil's advocate because I can see there's another question here that uh, touches on um, currency exposure and also looking at offshore equities, it's uh, from Jeff. He's just asked if the Satrix MSR products, so MCSR products are a good option for, for investors looking at that hard currency exposure. Also going to throw it out uh, if you want to talk about the split between you know developed and emerging markets. Yeah, sure. So there are two Satrix um, world products or, or glo global products. One is a developed market, one is an emerging market. Developed market, of course, gives you exposure to hard currencies. So that's mostly in the U.S., like 55, 60% of that portfolio is U.S. domiciled. 
you got large GBP exposure, yen exposure, euro exposure. So that's like your classic hard currency exposure. If you look at an emerging markets fund, of which I think South Africa makes up about 7%, so there is a little bit of overlap, which you'd have to be aware of. But there you've got classic emerging market currency exposure. You've got uh, Chinese exposure, you've got Brazilian exposure, Indian exposure, Russian exposure. Um, so you are picking up currency exposure that is more similar to the, the RAND. Um, effectively, what, what, what I'm saying is that those currencies which form part of an emerging markets basket have a much higher correlation with the RAND than, let's say, the US dollar. So if, if let's say, um, the Indian rupee is weakening, most likely scenario is that the RAND is weakening alongside, whereas it's not necessarily the same. So if you want genuine hard currency diversification, then a world product, a developed market world product would be better. If you're looking for potentially more growth, more long-term allocation, of course, considering that South Africa is an emerging market and that it falls part of that basket, then you know an emerging market allocation would be better. Um, yeah, it, it really comes down to what you're trying to achieve with your investment. Are you trying to diversify away from emerging markets, away from like the political risk that we see in South Africa, then go develop market. I mean, there's political risk everywhere, but um, we are more closely linked to the emerging market basket. Interestingly, South Africa itself, by buying like a top 50 or top 40 product, you're getting a blend of developed and emerging markets in, 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 that, in that index because of our dual listed um, environment where companies like Richmond, companies like British American Tobacco, AB InBev, almost certainly developed market kind of exposure, but some of our more African, South African centric um, companies, shop rights, uh, et cetera, um, tend to be more emerging markets like exposure. So we get a bit of a blend on our, on our own market itself. So it really comes down to investor preference and what you're trying to achieve. Fantastic, I think that was actually very helpful uh, just to show you where you can look at the different options and, and you know what you can expect. Uh, we've got more of a technical question here. Uh, someone's just asking, and they're using Satrix 40 as an example, but they're, they're really asking for country fours off or out of the top 40. Um, you know, does another company automatically replace that in your portfolio? Sure. So within the index world, if you have a, that, that would be called a rebalance event. And effectively what the, that's a FTSE JSC index, the top 40 index. So it's, it's calculated independently by the uh, FTSE JSC index team. They will, if a company were to fall out, it would most likely be falling out because of um, size and it would probably be falling out because there's a company that's now bigger and that bigger company, so let's say it went from 41 to 40 and the other company went from 40 to let's say 50 because the, the price had dropped from the ship, the, the market cap had dropped that would be replaced by another company in most instances. There are some strange corporate action events where you may have a company that is excluded from the index and not one included, but there, I haven't seen one of those. So it's not something you need to worry about necessarily. Perfect. Um, any other questions? I mean, on that, to give you an idea, um, recently we saw Rock, Rock Castle and Nepi merger. Now they made up, they were part of an index, uh, the SAPI index, which is a FTSE JC index as well. Um, and what happened there was when the two companies merged, they effectively became one. And because they were now one company, they obviously were much larger. So their combined effective weight before and after the transaction were identical in the portfolio. Um, and then after that event, there were only 19 property shares in the index. So there was an immediate rebalance to include another one and a small component came in. That's the kind of thing that will happen at a rebalance. Perfect, but I mean, you as the, the holder of one of the units of an ETF aren't really gonna be affected. It's sure. something that the, the obviously the product provider is gonna be sorting out on, on your behalf. Yeah. Look, that's one of the beauties of buying a, a product wrap like an ETF is that, first of all, when that trade happens, there's no capital gains tax. Whereas if you were holding those shares in your personal capacity, you wanted to trade in and out of one stock because of the size uh, uh, dynamic, you would trigger a, a CGT event, so there's a tax inefficiency, you would also trigger um, uh, brokerages, which we will pick up as the portfolio managers, but we, of course, because we're institutional, 
we're trading at much lower rates. We're trading at like six basis points and, and that kind of thing to execute a trade like that. So there are benefits of one of the benefits is when there's turnover at a portfolio level, it's very efficient for you as a client invested in the ETF. You, you're not impacted in that scenario. Perfect. Well, if there's no more questions, I just would like to uh, take the opportunity to thank Chris for coming through for obviously always imparting some good information to, to you guys as users and um, also for, for the patience um, with the confusion of this webinar. Thanks. Yeah. I just want to read a quote from the top of it from Warren Buff Buffett, who says, most investors, both institutional and individual, will find the best way to own common stock is through an index fund that charges minimal fees. Agreed. Cheers.